My name is Leah Goldstein. Um, I was in the military. I was in the police force. I was a pro racer um, for about seven years in Europe and then the next seven years uh, in North America. I was a cyclist, an ultra-endurance rider, and now motivational speaker. For me, success, I think, is when you have something in your mind that you want to do, and you have to go at it like your life is dependent on it. Because if you have a passion and a will, I believe everything is possible. There's a saying that you're probably familiar with, fight or flight. Yes, you've heard it. But most people don't fight and they don't flight. They freeze. And they'll freeze for a very long time because they're afraid to go this way or that way. And that's what stops us from progression, from you doing the things that you want to do. I was young and I was a loner. I didn't socialize very good, so I was picked on a lot. I was bullied a little bit. So I had a choice, to run away or to fight. My answer was Bruce Lee. <laughs> I saw him on TV. He's a small little man, and he fought 20 people. I was in the same situation. I had little boys chasing me, and I decided one day to stop running, and I faced them, and I said, you want to fight me? Fight me now. And it was me standing up that gave me power, and for that one head boy, whatever, to actually say, forget it, and go look for somebody else who was weak. And I realized that this is kind of the process of life, that you can never run away from somebody who's bullying you or who's telling you that you can't do anything. So I applied. I applied to go into this course that of course was only open to men. And I was denied just like that. To me, it's not acceptable. I'm in the most sophisticated base in the army. I know how to use an Uzi. I was an expert shot. I know how to use the Jericho or Beretta. I know how to work with gas. I'm Krav Maga. I did every physical test that the, man, the men did, and I also trained with the commando. I wasn't a commando, but I did the same training. It wasn't acceptable to me. There was no way I was going to back down and say, OK. There was no way. I made a stink. I wrote to every official there was. I went to the headquarters. I even wrote to the prime minister. I did everything. And people said to me, it will never happen. It will never happen. I got a phone call. I don't know if you guys know Yaakov Turner. He was the Prime Minister of Israel. He was now the Chief of Police. He told me in 30 minutes, come to a location that was in Netanya, a little bit north in Israel. You have 30 minutes, come to my office. Come into my, his office, and he's sitting there. He's a little man, little man, sitting on books. It makes him look taller. And he said to me, I'll give you permission, but no special treatment. That's all I asked for. And I was in. I said, hallelujah, I'm finally in. But my hell just begun. Because when I went into the base, I wasn't accepted with warm greetings. The lieutenants there had bets on how many hours I would last the first day, not days, but hours. And I knew that. Because everybody else were soldiers that were coming from the Soviet Union. Some of them worked for the intelligence, some worked for the KGB. We had some people from Argentina there, some Israelis there, not a lot. Sabras are actually born in Israel. And then they had me. And the lieutenant of the course came up to me and said, one tear comes out of your eye, and you're out of here. One tear. I ended up graduating in the top 10 in this course. I was the first woman. And at this time, too, I was transferring all that anger onto my bike that I was winning races with such dominance. But for me, I always felt better after I rode. And Israel now had an Olympic team. They wanted, they got a budget to make an Olympic cycling team. So because I was kind of cracking in a way, and I had my way, 
of talking and dealing, and I did a lot of work, they said, okay, we will give you a part-time release to pursue a cycling career. And that's what I did. I came back to Canada. Because actually, a story that happened during my training, I went back to Canada for 10 days to see my parents, and I was riding in Richmond on River Road. And the Canadian national cycling team, you know, Clara Hughes, Allison Sider, Linda Jackson, if you follow that, they were on that ride. And I was just, I brought my bike, I had a, not a very expensive bike, and I hopped on kind of to their training session. And Sarah Neal, who's also an Olympian for Canada, said to me, where did you come out of? So I lied and said, I'm just visiting my parents from California, whatever, you know, because I couldn't tell anybody what I did. She said, God, if you ever, do you have a Canadian passport? I go, yes, I have a Canadian passport. Because if you ever come back to Canada, call me. We could, you know, we want to train, we want to see what, what you have, what you're all about. Because Canada was really developing now in the cycling world because they were training now in Europe. Now, you know, Europe for cycling, it's like the hockey here, right? They're crazy about cycling there, more than hockey here. Because the mentality is different. The girls start riding when they're born. It's like hockey, it's exactly the same thing. I went back, always kind of had that in the back of my mind. So anyways, when I came back to Canada, I did, I hopped on, right away I was onto the national development team. But I wasn't a good climber. So I took one year, I heard that I got mad. I took one year and I lost about 15 pounds and I came back winning almost everything. There wasn't one race I didn't win. And now it was open season. Any team I could have chosen, any team. It's a little quote that I like too. Because it was my passion and my goal. And just hearing that I couldn't climb and I would always be kind of just a time trial, I only have one job. I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to lead a team. I wanted to be the Lance Armstrong. Not necessarily him right now, but at the time. <laughs> I go, who's coming up on me? Before they could even answer, Shiana passed me so fast, it, I didn't even see her coming. It was like I was standing still. And she looked over at me and she said, oh, you don't look good. And I didn't. And her confidence was unbelievable. And I had a hard time just keeping her in view. But it was like a cat mouse chase the whole way. For about the next 35 hours, she would pass me, I would pass her. She would pass me, I would pass her. And every time she passed me, she said something really negative that I took kind of to heart. And it slowed me down, because I didn't know how to respond to that. Then I remember my coach, when I was kickboxing, he said to me, you are going to hear that all the time. Insults, criticism, whatever. How do you respond? How are you going to respond? Are you going to take it and let it bury you? Bring you down? Are you going to take it, store it, and use it for energy? You have a choice. And that's going to be with anything. Any insult you have, any obstacle you have, it's what you do with that criticism. And I decided at that moment, I was gonna take those insults and everything bad she said and put it here. And when I got into Utah, when they started climbing, I would release it there. And that's exactly what I did. In Utah, I put 45 minutes on her in the climbs. because I thought about everything she said. And I just started riding like never before. I ended up crossing the line, breaking the record by 12 hours and beating her by 10 hours. And I'm done, that's it. I said, I'm finished racing, I'm so done, you know, thank you.